Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the London School of Economics and Political Science. My name is Minou Shafiq, and I'm the director of LSE, and we are very happy to welcome all of you to this very special event. This evening's public lecture celebrates the BBC's centenary year, the 100th anniversary of an institution that has never been more important or relevant. As perhaps the most famous and trusted brand in the UK, the BBC has accompanied its worldwide audiences through depression, wars, pandemics, and the countless revolutions in culture and daily life of the 20th and 21st centuries. And now it is again playing a crucial role in informing citizens about the crisis in Ukraine, including over 10 million citizens from Russia who are tuning in to the BBC Russian website at three times their normal rate to find out what is really happening. The public conversation about the BBC's purpose, its present and future, led in part by our own Department of Media and Communications here at the LSE, concerns itself with how public service broadcasting can retain its prominent presence in a competitive media market. How can it succeed in maximizing the diversity and plurality of its content? and how it interprets its mandate to provide impartial news to its audience and many, many other issues. To discuss these subjects, it gives me huge pleasure to welcome the Director General of the BBC, Tim Davey. Tim rose to the top post at the BBC in September 2020 as the culmination of a stellar 15-year career at the corporation, during which he served as Director of Marketing, Communications and Audiences, Director of Audio and Music, and most recently, Chief Executive of BBC Studios, the BBC's principal commercial subsidiary. He's no stranger to the current job, having served as acting BBC Director General from November 2012 to April 2013. He joined the BBC from PepsiCo, where he worked uh, from the marketing division to become Vice President of Marketing and Franchise of PepsiCo Europe. A graduate of Selwyn College, Cambridge. He's also co-chairman of the Creative Industries Council, a trustee of the Tate, and a former chair of Comic Relief. Tonight, Tim and I will discuss the importance of public service broadcasting, if the BBC can remain competitive in the digital age, and how the BBC can meet its goal of serving as a truly national institution. We'll then open the floor to the audience to participate in the conversation, and we're eager to hear from our students, alumni, and friends from around the world. The questions will be moderated by our Department of Media and Communications, so please do provide us with your name and your affiliation. And if you're following the conversation on Twitter, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSEBBC. But before we begin our discussion, the BBC would like to show a video celebrating its centenary entitled, The BBC Belongs to All of Us. We're on air in five, four. BBC One. Well, defining the BBC's role involves answering the central question, what is public service broadcasting? It literally means provide... Boring! Let, 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 me, let me rephrase that. Um, the BBC has something for everyone. Everyone. That includes you. Caroline and John from Cornwall. So the question is, what do you want? How about a full throttle tango? Or a high-ranking corrupt police officer with a soft centre? Or do you require assistance? Think about the square root of 350,000 litres of milk. What about banger of the... Banger. <laughs> but there's more to it than that. The BBC is... A unique experiment. There's no angle, there's no bias vibes. No sponsors. Interfering with play. It's a bridge between us. A common ground between us. Look a bit closer. It's a reflection of who we are. <laughs> but here's the thing. The BBC doesn't have to be here. It only exists if we really believe. It matters. 
we're in it together, aren't we? Let's do this. Come here. The BBC. There's something that belongs to all of us. Every one of us. Every one of us. good start. So, Tim, by any measure, the BBC is one of the largest, oldest, and most significant media organizations in the world. And so, as your centenary film showed, it's also a national institution. Could you give us a short description of what your current view is on the state of the corporation today? Thank you, Manisha. Thanks, everyone, for joining um, the discussion. Um, that's a big question. I think where I sit today is actually when it comes to the purposes of this hundred year old organization, when we look at them and we talk to members of the public, they remain incredibly strong. And I would argue that uh, in your introduction, you were kind enough to mention in these troubled times, the numbers of people in Russia coming to our services. But Actually, 92%, I just literally, as I came into this session, saw the latest weekly numbers, which was 92% of people in the UK came to the BBC adult on the week of 7th of February this year. So we remain relevant and we remain relevant because of our purposes, I think. Um, and I think that gets the heart of what do we believe in, in terms of our values, democratic debate, what do we want to do in terms of growth of our creative industries and, and our, our value in that regard? But also, frankly, the relevance to individual families in terms of education, content, television, all the various things and radio, we're in a decent position. So, so I'm confident. And I think the organization delivers generally strong metrics through, you know, in terms of as, as I see them today. But I think the interesting for us as an institution is there's two major trends that necessitate, for the first time in this institution's history, a need for reinvention and reform, which we'll talk, we can talk about. And those two things are you no longer have a position in which you have dominant distribution. So we had two out of four TV channels. We had a lot of the radio frequency. And as many disrupted businesses who are incumbent businesses know, when, when the internet strips away distribution advantage, you have to work harder. We have infinite choice of content. So that's changed. The second thing is this is now a global market. So we have huge players of scale. And what those things require you to do is not assume that you can just carry on as you were in how you deliver against your purposes. So my sense is we're in a strong position. We've got real relevance to the British public and half a billion people around the world. I'm actually very bullish about the BBC's role and its purposes. But I feel for the first time, we've got genuine jeopardy in terms of how we deliver that. And if we don't reshape and think about how we deliver and make choices in a digital world, then obviously there are threats to the BBC. <laughs> So let me turn to news. And one of your important purposes is to provide impartial news and information to help people understand and engage with the world around them. But there's been controversy about what impartiality means. Does it always mean balancing opposing views? Does it mean always giving opposing views equal time? And what are the choices the BBC needs to make in order to retain that, that mantle of impartiality? It's, it's, a, it's a huge question and one we wrestle with every, to, every day. And I don't think we'll reach perfection, by the way. But I think we've made a very deliberate choice. And people know that I'm pretty slightly obsessive about value to audiences. What do people, what do people really value from the BBC? And I've listed a few things, but top of my list is impartial news, information, essentially trust. If you're not trusted as the BBC, our value erodes. And it's really interesting talking to maybe some of the more emerging players that are coming up on the media scene. The one thing they talk to me is, how do you get so much trust? How do you build trust? And 
central to that is this notion of impartial, fair, balanced coverage, which we'll talk about news, but I think it goes broader than news. And the first point is we have made a deliberate choice to fight to deliver that. And I use the word fight because I think in the noisy world I've written about, about this many times, which is in a world in which we've got polarized media, we've got raging social, uh, you know, social media debates, things can get very polarized very fast. Mm -hmm. We're seeing disinformation. There is a real problem with finding the truth. I don't think that exists solely in, you might say, traditional places where free media has been suppressed. It's also in more advanced societies. You know, the US is a more polarized market, in my view. And, you know, we have to worry about that here in the UK and globally. Now, that choice, by the way, is not an easy choice. I think it's required us with our colleagues here, people working in this organization to really think about, OK, what are my personal prejudices? What you know, I can't join campaigns. I've got to really get different points of view. To your point, it's certainly not about a mechanical, you know, let's do one debate side here, one one side there, at equal weight. That's not impartiality. It is a fair rep. I mean, you could you could get many definitions, but it's a fair representation of the points of view. But it is also a seeking of the truth. It's trying to get a fact-based discussion. And just for what it's worth, we did research just fresh in. This is absolutely fresh, which is, you know, 87% of people when asked say they put a priority on getting impartial news over news that solely gives their point of view. Mm -hmm. and, and this isn't binary. It's not just about most people will read a, a newspaper that may have a particular lens on life, but then come to the BBC to look, and we often we have lots of challenges around 16 to 34s and younger audiences, but you know we have huge numbers of them, eight, over 80 percent coming to, to the BBC every week. And often they're going to polarized media, they're going to other places, but they come to the BBC to get the facts. We don't need all of their time, but we need to be providing a place where they get a fair and balanced assessment and you know a wise analysis. If you take Steve Rosenberg in Moscow at the moment, or Clive Myrie bravely in that bunker in Kiev, that, that's people come to us and we're going to fight to maintain that impartiality. Last point I'd say is other organizations have shown that if you do not fight for it deliberately, you can drift into places where you suddenly find yourself, you know, on the wrong end of a debate or you come back. And I'm walking that tightrope every day. It's not without stress, but it's a choice we've made. And I think it's really, really important for the BBC. Mm -hmm. Well, we've just been through a period uh, of the pandemic in which misinformation uh, about vaccines, about the origins of COVID, about the validity of different treatments uh, was rife. Mm -hmm. How did the BBC see its role during this time of crisis? And what did the BBC learn from this extraordinary period of the pandemic? Um, well, the good news is we learned there is a huge appetite for factual information, huge. You know, and, and, and proper clear presentation of people you trust, uh, by people you trust was incredibly important. Second thing is we learned that local information is very important. I think this is a moment actually where the, the different nuances between national po policy in the nations, we saw huge responses to what's happening in your postcode, what's happening in different areas, local and regional reporting. The biggest, I, I use this uh, line uh, quite a lot, which is what is the biggest television program in the UK today? Okay, if, if you look at the overnight ratings for good old fashioned linear television, Nearly every night, the biggest program is the 6.30 regional news. Yeah, this tells you something about people are connected to their air. They wanted the local information as well as the, the, the wider information. Definitely wanted facts. They definitely wanted spaces where they could, that things could be debated and talked about. I don't think they fully want, you know, wanted to cancel views where you never heard from people who frankly, you, you know, the uh, anti-vax person that we may want to challenge them with some of the science bluntly. They, it's not that we were wanted, they wanted 
for them to be not on air, but they want a proper, robust discussion. And that was important that we never during that debate said, you know, there are fringe views that may not make the cut, but broad mainstream opinions, people who have different views, we should absolutely air them, have those debates and bring out different points of view. And I think we needed to be confident in doing that throughout the crisis. And I believe that helped rather than hindered uh, getting the facts out. Mm, absolutely. But, so despite all these good things we've said, opinion polling seems to suggest that the British public doesn't consider the BBC good value for money. What's your response to that? And what does your own research tell you about how the public perceives the BBC? Well, we're, we're perceived pretty, I mean, I, I, I don't for a minute um, like BBC executives, assuming they've got all the answers, Manish. So I, I say this sensitively, but actually, when you look at people's ascribed value for the BBC at £13 a month, sorry, I'll, I won't start selling too hard, but actually, we're in a pretty decent place in terms of people's estimated value of what they think they get for radio services, TV services, and all the things that they get. So across the vast, vast majority of households, in pure value terms, we're doing pretty well. There, are, there is a small number of households who are using us for you know, a limited time. And they're probably, by the way, I think they're the biggest threat to the BBC. We need to be relevant to everyone. I, I get less obsessed by particular you know, politics or ins and outs of the latest situation. I get very obsessed by how relevant and the value we give to every household. By and large, that is good. In terms of, we can talk license fee and mechanics, you know, as, as it sits today, our research shows that, you know, there's, there's lots of split opinions. Actually, the license fee may not be perfect, but for nearly half the population, it is the way in which they think the BBC should be funded and nothing else gets close. There's other, you know, not, mm. not few would like it, you say, give me some advertising, others would go to subscription, but actually license fee stacks up this is not a, this is not me closed minded to the future. It's just saying as we sit today, it kind of works. Yeah. yeah. So, Tim, in your in your opening statement about the state of the corporation, you you mentioned competing in the digital age, and it is a very different media landscape than when the BBC started, obviously, a hundred years ago. Um, so let's 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 talk about that issue and. In, Let's start with the license fee and the way the BBC is funded. The most recent uh, license fee settlement froze the fee license fee for the next two years at a time when inflation is very high. So what are the consequences of that settlement for your programming, particularly things like drama, news, and children's programming, which are distinctive to the BBC? Well, we've got, I mean, for those uh, not close to it, uh, which probably is most people, it, we've got six years of funding. Two years flat, four years at CPI. Um, as I've said, I was disappointed because I would have liked CPI across the period, although I recognise the household incomes are under a lot of pressure, and we are a we're set. Yeah, you know, the set is set by government. We understand that. So I think, from a, my point of view, I've got a balanced assessment of it. I'm disappointed to your point about where inflation is going, but I have to say we've got nearly mm. 23 billion of income, which gives us some certainty of planning. And I'm very specific about it, which is, you know, in the last year, in terms of our public service revenue, and not many people think, I, th I think enough people think about this in the BBC says, which is, you know, we've got the commercial revenue. And, you know, we now have a 1.6 billion commercial subsidiary growing fast. Um, actually, license fee numbers are holding up well. But the license fee settlement itself means that if you just take the last year, so we take a slice in uh, 2027, we'll be at 4.2 billion of license fee income on our forecast for versus 4.485. So about, about 285 million light. That does mean we're, we're gonna have to cut a few things. Um, and the first thing we'll do is constantly drive efficiencies, wiping out duplication. Our benchmarks are pretty good on that, but we'll be at any non-working cost. But we'll, we can't do quite as much as we want to do. And we'll just have to make choices where the audience value is less and we'll do slightly less. But I would not, I don't think for, for a minute this is, means we're out the game. We, we still have the ability to drive our commercial income. We've got a license fee set. 
the biggest thing we'll assess a little bit with the with the cuts the biggest thing is how we repurpose the 4.2 billion and the the majority of our money so that it absolutely delivers most added value in a digital age that's a big change for a an, an organization that's primarily delivering value overwhelming through linear broadcast at this point in time. That's the big challenge. Right. So let's talk about after 2027. Uh, so the, the government announced the end of the mandatory license fee after 2027, but that raises, of course, huge questions about the funding model. What are you thinking about that? Are you open to a progressive license fee structure after 2027? What happens to the universality principle if you have to move to a subscription model? Uh, and what would the BBC look like after 2027 under this new funding model, uh, whatever that might be? Yeah, I, I, the first thing is, I, I'm not sure the government announced it. I know someone tweeted it. <laughs> so, 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 so I, the first thing is, we've got funding for 27. Beyond that, I'm very, I think we, we, you know, I think the license fee has worked exceptionally well. But I think it's not the first order question, if I may. The, which, the first order question is exactly where you went to, which is, what's universal and what isn't? That's the bigger question. That it, honestly, that's the big question because, you know, my view is the licensee is a very good way of funding universal broadcasting. But there are other, there are uh, there's three or four other models in Europe, which people can have a look at. Yeah. So, so but the, the question is the really the question for all of us is what do we do? What what do we want to deliver together as a you because universality drives certain behaviours. It, it absolutely, the, the, the stresses and joys of this job are that I'm not trying to make a subset of the, of the population happy. I'm genuinely struggling to give value to everyone. Value. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's, that's a really different brief, isn't it? I've worked on commercial businesses. So if you were running a commercial business, if 20% of the population love you, you can make a great commercial business. But the, and by the way, we do it by not just going for reach, it's, it gets even harder than that. And by the way, I'm not moaning because it is a wonderful brief. You have to get to everyone, but give them something differentiated. We are not, I love Netflix. I love Sky. I love these companies, I, genuinely, but we're not doing what they're doing. They're not doing local news. They're not doing, you know, the UK drama we do. They're not developing the UK creative industries in, in the way we do. They do different things. They do good things. But we are doing something different. They don't do bite-sized education to 80% of GCSE students. I could go on. So now, I think when it comes to 27, that will be the biggest debate, which is what's universal or not. My personal view is I am a fan of public service. I think one of the wonders of the UK is we have public service broadcasting that is not wholly about market failure. It's not mm -hmm. wholly about no one would ever do this. So we'll just have a little bit of high fiber broadcasting on the side. I, I, I would suggest looking at maybe the US or other markets where you've got a market failure public bro broadcaster. Mm -hmm. My view is we've got to be really careful before we dispense with a broader scale public service intervention, which has proven to be rather an enlightened blend with the private sector in growing the creative industries and driving you know, democratic values, all of that. Having said that, you know, we have a very strong commercial business in the UK, Manish. We, we grow, you know, we own UK TV. So the, the, the BBC is in some ways running models and we want to see growth and we are open minded and we'll, we were always going to look at all options. We should look at all options. You're not going to get me to jump on the exact mechanic at this point. But some of the questions you ask, we should all be asking. And open my. And by the way, what final point is? I think some of the commentary around the BBC. You know, we've got our head in the sand, and we're not we're not interested in other options. And talk, look, we we see that we'll fight for the validity of the license fee at this point because we we believe it to be a brilliant way of funding public service broadcasting. But what we're fighting for more than anything is public service broadcasting and what it brings and the value of that with commerciality as part of that. We've got a commercial arm. Mm. Um, and that's the big thing. That's the big thing for me. Well, so let's talk about the commercial arm. Uh, the BBC is aiming to grow commercial income by 30 percent over a five year period. Um, what, talk a little bit about that. How does the promotion of things like iPlayer fit into this? 
into this strategy when competition from streaming is growing exponentially. And if you're going to take a more commercial approach, should the BBC be able to borrow from capital markets or partner with tech companies to build more hybrid revenue sources? How, how commercial do you, do you need to be to, enable to, to be able to survive in this more digital marketplace? Well, I think we're, we are very ambitious for that commercial business. And, you know, I think 30% is a CEO. 30% is my, you know, the minimum I expect. So, so I, I, I'm, I'm very ambitious for it. I, I think, um, and, and what powers that business, and we'll talk about the capital requirements in a minute, which I think are critical. What, what powers that business is essentially, you know, two huge kind of growth, areas of growth potential. Yeah. I don't want to overstate them with the word huge, but they're they're big, but you need you need to remain focused. So we're not trying to take on Disney here and do what they're doing, but we're doing something very focused on what the BBC is and what it does best. And those two areas are firstly production. Again, this is for a bit detailed, but for people, we used to have production wholly inside the public service. We lifted that out. And now if you're working for the BBC Natural History Unit, you can make for anyone. We're doing big commissions mm. for other broadcasters. That, the reason we did it was just to keep talent in the BBC because otherwise they were going off. Yeah. And, and that has worked really well. So we're growing a production business and our reputation, our craft skills, our ability to make pro that we're at the foothills of how far we can grow that business. And that, you know, is a whole new area that's growing really well. BBC Studios doing well and can keep growing. The second area is where you went, which is director consumer services. Yeah, we've had a very good business just selling selling finished TV programs like kind of broadly to other broadcasters and doing some linear channels. But we're now at an age where we're beginning to enter the D2C world, of course, direct to consumer, sorry. And we've got a joint venture with uh, ITV called Britbox and Estates. Mm. I said publicly that, you know, what is the future for subscription news services from the BBC? What I think is slightly more difficult is people say to me, why don't you just switch the iPlayer on around the world? Yeah, and it, and the, it's a really easy line, yeah? The problem, by the way, is think about, really think about the iPlayer. Firstly, a lot of the things that are happening on iPlayer are because we sell the international rights and we co-fund them together with other partners. We do the UK, they do international. Secondly, a lot of iPlayer is great UK output, but it's not necessarily ready immediately to go and sit in Germany and being a big hit against Netflix. Yeah. So we are beginning to think about, okay, how do we go into really what I call big niches? We are looking at how we expand D to C, but we need to be considered about that. Last point is we do need more capital. Mm. And that part of the license fee settlement is because it's not the most exciting bit in terms of headlines, but is massive is we have extended uh, the government borrowing limit significantly up to 750 million that gives us another few hundred million of headroom so that we can invest to grow and last last point is partnership of course we this is an age where we're going to be partnering with people Britbox in the us is a 50 50 joint venture with itv we partner with people with capital we've had success in the past with amc with the bbc america channel but now into non-linear this is an age of partnership no doubt about it okay let me uh give you my final question before turning to the audience, which is around the BBC's role as a national institution. Uh, now, clearly the BBC is often considered a unifying national institution, particularly important at a time when societies are fragmenting, people are living in their bubbles, et cetera, et cetera. Given this important social role, how do you see the BBC fitting into things like the government's leveling up agenda and in terms of unifying the nation? and and also, how does how does it fit into your diversity targets, both on screen and behind the camera, in terms of the BBC acting as a as a unifying symbol uh, for for the nation? Um, I think we play a critical role. I, there's two there's, there's two things in my head, which kind of in terms of this. Firstly, there's the broadcasting of itself. So you know, there's no doubt that we are in our lovely Zoom worlds. We are all itching for experiences where we're, you know, we're seeing things together. We're feeling, I mean, I, sports events now are wonderful because you can be celebrating someone who you have diametrically opposed 
political views. You could, you know, it's just these unifying things where we come together. We're seeing, by the way, massive response to those things. And, and I think editorial <laughs> administration, how you facilitate grown up sensible debate. I think we've got to think about the digital potential, the potential of the digital world to facilitate interaction, democratic process. We have huge, a huge role to play as that, as the BBC, as a facilitator of a national discussion, no doubt. I think the, on the organizational side, we are, I mean, I am obsessed with, we are there to serve all and every household. And I mean, I'm, I, I, as the director general, kind of, when I'm on a train, I look at every house, I look at every apartment and I go, I'm flat, I go 159 pounds. Am I getting, another? now to do that, we have to engage in what may be termed huge amount of leveling up activity. So pushing money outside the M25. I've, I'm doing 25 million to the Northeast, the production fund. Look, a couple of weeks ago, moving titles like MasterChef to Birmingham, Salford Development. You know, we've got 53,000 jobs directly linked to the BBC and the creative industries. We want most people outside the, you know, outside the M25. Most of our funding in television for the first time ever, we have 60% of our commissioning spend outside the M25. And this isn't anti-London. It's just literally leveling up of our spend. We do that, not final points, we do that not just purely kind of because it's the right thing to do for balancing kind of um, our spend. Mm. It's because if I'm delivering that as a, as, a, as a kind of content maker, all of it seeps into the content. So if you get a drama like Responder, which may, many, hopefully many of you have seen, which is based in Liverpool, that does brilliantly on network, but it also scores well in the 33% share versus 27% in the Northwest. So you get those connections. If you broadcast a Today programme from Liverpool, it, this isn't tokenistic, it seeps into the programme. And, and, and this is the kind of thing we are doing fundamentally, as well as apprenticeships. We, we, we've launched ourselves an apprenticeship training agency in Birmingham, because there's no version of events where the BBC just comes along on its own we have to be catalytic to the wider creative industries. I'm not interested, by the way, in just growing the BBC. I'm, I'm only interested in the context of the wider creative industries. We can be like the first domino, like in Salford, in Birmingham, other places. We, we can be, a, we're, we're, we're kind of almost seed capital for the, in my view, public seed capital for the creative industries. The great thing about the BBC is we're also accountable because the license fee will, has to deliver value and we're held to account for that. But we are seed capital, and I really believe that should be spread across the country. Cool. I'm going to start turning to audience questions, uh, and I've got a first one here from Bob Ward, who is the Policy and Communications Director of our own Grantham Research Institute at the LSE for Climate and Environment. And so he says, earlier this year, David Jordan, the BBC's Director of Editorial Policy, told a House of Lords committee that, quote, if a lot of people believe in, in a flat earth, we'd need to address it more in order to ensure impartiality. Why isn't the BBC more concerned with accuracy when it comes to reporting factual issues? And I maybe I should have a caveat here, which is Bob spends a lot of his life um, refuting climate deniers. Right. We're obsessed with accuracy. Accuracy is everything. The fact base is everything. I don't think that means that you don't give voice to pe ever, ever. You need, there's a question of proportionality, Bob, but there's, it, I think that doesn't mean you never give voice to op opinion formers or people who are leading. You know, often we see in this world through social media, people emerge as voices on issues or they, they get attraction on their opinions. I actually think, and they're not experts, but they're often people who are sounding off to a lot of people, bluntly. I actually think the right thing to do is interrogate them with facts to talk. Now, I think you'll be careful. I'm not talking about chaos where everyone that's got any voice on anything. But David, I was in the meeting. Um, I'm always happy in a select committee when someone else is answering the question. But David, David, David answered that question. He was very clear. He said, if, if there was enough scale of opinion, if we got to a point that, and it wasn't kind of we were in a bit of absurdity at that point. If 20 percent of the population thought the world was flat. And sometimes when you look at, I mean, some of these stories and 
rumours that develop into pseudo fact. I recommend our podcast, The Coming Storm by Gabriel Gatehouse. Have a listen. And I think it's important we get those people who are frankly spouting opinion or got that and we debate that we put them on air and we test and we we go for, but accuracy is everything and and but and it's not an open house i think it's about proportionality and i, I do think that's valid okay next question is from sylvia harvey who asks could the bbc do more to help people in britain understand the concerns and anxieties of russia since the period when as the then soviet union it was a close military ally of the west during the second world war um of course we can do it uh, by the way I, i'm always up for uh, feedback on the the editorial out but but what my view is, of course we we could probably do more i would argue some if i've got a defensive twitch it's you know if you look at ed sturton looking at a, you know the thousand year history of the region um and all the things we've done on radio Four, the analysis we're doing i think we're doing a pretty good job and and that historical context is pretty critical do I think we should be carving out space where there is a calmer analysis of the broader geopolitical trends that, uh, you know, that shape these, that are shaping these events? You know, this story, and also it's really interesting. I think one of the jobs of the BBC is there are people, if I dare, dare I use the words, in the beltway who are quite, you know, maybe quite interested in these things, assume a deeper understanding. We, we, or, we, we, we've got to make sure you know, we have a real role to bring that understanding to more people, you know, frankly, people who may not have lived through the Cold War, you know, all those things. We do have a deep responsibility on that. So, look, of course, we could do more. I think at the moment, if I'll be blunt, I think our, we're, we're doing it. I would say this. I think we're doing an outstanding job of the coverage of an incredibly difficult situation. And I do think we are taking stock as we speak in terms of how some of these bigger trends, I've got about four or five editorial topics in my head at least, where I think some of this more calmer analysis and more detailed analysis needs to take place. And absolutely we can do that. We shouldn't just do it on Radio 4, also online, other places, absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, next one is from Irva Aiken who asks, do you think legislation similar to the EU's upcoming Media Freedom Act is needed to ensure the independence of public service media in the UK, particularly the BBC? Um, I hope not. The reason <laughs> I say that, the reason I, although I, I have to say as a, as a board member of the European Broadcasting Union, there are significant risks to free and fair reporting in too many countries at this point. Yeah. Bluntly, I mean, now we have our independence enshrined in a charter and that is precious. We also need to ensure that the public service broadcasting ecology, for want of a better word, I've never, I haven't come up with a better one, but ecology, I think needs to be protected. And to me, that absolutely is sacrosanct. The exact mechanic of that, I'll be blunt, because I'm not, whether it's the media free or, or the charter, and if in our case, I think is pretty critical. I would say, however, there's some very important secondary issues to that, because we could be, we could be safe on principle, but actually there's big areas like prominence. So are we, you know, the facts are we have, inter, we have intervened historically to ensure the prominence of public service. I'm just not talking about the BBC, I'm talking about the public service broadcasters in total. We have intervened in a linear environment in platforms like Freeview to ensure that public service broadcasting is prominent. I think I'm as much concerned about that in terms of legislation as anything else. How do we maintain our prominence as public service broadcast? As a society, are we going to make sure that if we're there at least trying our damnedest to get fair, truthful reporting, and we're not perfect, but that, that we're doing that work, how can we make sure that has together we decided that that gets prominence on digital platforms and 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 other where, where you've got other gatekeepers in place i think that's that's the really in terms of legislation that is there's a number of things but that would be my biggest priority in terms of some of some of the work that's going on in terms of legislation okay 
So another question from Debs Grayson at Goldsmiths. If the BBC is indeed a crucial player in hosting democratic conversations, do you think there's scope for the BBC itself to be democratized, to allow more avenues for citizens to participate in commissioning regulation and governance? And I might just add a footnote to that, uh, which is given the debate about the license fee and the funding model post 2027, what kind of democratic input should go into that decision making? Great question. Um, firstly, Minish, I think I think there's absolutely no version of events, and we, we we need to do some more work. But there's absolutely no version of events where the public themselves are not engaged in, in a very profound and deep way. It's interesting how you do that because you know, frankly, it's not often, it's not just the noisiest you should be hearing from. <laughs> you know, my email's full of. Uh, regular, reg, 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 regular communicators, should we say? Yeah, who? who but, but they're often pals. You've got lots of pen pals. I've got, I've got lots of pen pals with lots of views. <laughs> often, often to be honest, they're often people who really care about the BBC, but have got lots of views about how it could improve. In some ways, they're not. In some ways, they're not always the most always the most important people that we go listen. We go listen to people who are on the fringes of democratic debate or feel excluded by. How do we bring them in? What could the BBC provide for them? We've got to be very open-minded and flexible about that. So I think we do need more public consultation. How that then relates to the running of the BBC, where I flinch slightly is when you, when you say things like commissioning. Because I do think at the end of the day, you get, a, you get your brief, and then I think the magic happens, which you hire fantastic people to commission creatively against that brief. Then they're judged and they're very accountable to their, the numbers and the delivery, just in the news, newsroom, I think, you know, you don't want, we obviously look at what stories are well are most read. We've got huge amounts of audience data guiding us all the time, massive data points. With, I mean, the, the, the packs I look at monthly are very significant. So it's not as if I don't feel accountable to the audience. I know exactly how many people come to us, how many people are registered to all our products, time spent, we're all over the metrics. But I think commissioning, at the end of the day, we're an editorial organization and you want to hear what the editor of the tech, that, I think that system remains. I, I do think when it comes to debate, digital will, must allow us more interesting and creative ways to get more interactivity, more views, live data of opinion. You know, we, we, you know, we could be much, I, I think impartiality has been defined a little bit and I came in and I felt there were some risks. So I kind of was, was absolutely putting impartiality at the center and said, look, we don't do this. We've got to be clear on this. I'm interested the next stage, I think, the next or stage and age will be how do these digital technologies bring data up to, to, to fact check. There's a whole lot of things we could do to get audience input more live into our output. I'm quite interested in that. And, and weirdly, there's, there's, this is strange thing to say, there's bits of our schedule like spring watch surveys or things you get quick data where you get huge numbers. And I think we're at the foothills of using the audience in our programming. So they're not commissioning, but they're contributing, they're shaping. I think that's really interesting. How it fits the BBC's overall governance, I think we've got to reflect on a bit. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let me come to uh, another question. Do you think that we'll see greater collaboration between public service broadcasters in facing the challenges of competition in the digital media market? such as a consolidated BDOD offering to help deal with issues of prominence. I think you might need to explain what BDOD means. Yeah, a broadcaster video, basically, I play at ITV Hub. Um, uh, the, the, I think that, that's my BVOD. If anyone else has got a different BVOD out there, then <laughs> probably, but, but a broadcaster video on demand. Um, well, the, the, we've, had a, we've had a pretty good history of collaboration. We forget this. It's called mm. FreeSat, FreeView, working together on the platforms. Uh, expanding DAB radio together. I worked a lot with um, commercial radio. We, we obviously, you know, we can be having our fun and games over, you know, uh, debate, kind of fighting for talent, all that, but actually growing the, growing the audio market from FM into DAB was something I felt very, the BBC doesn't need, one of our key metrics is not market share. It, it's, I like growing markets together for the commercial side as well. And I actually think we need to work together. All right. I absolutely think that. But then you then you get the question of how you work together. So, you know, I talked about the BritBox part, partnership internationally. 
The, the only thing I'd say about merger of full merger of plat platforms, and, it, and, and it, this gets a bit technical, but what is a platform in that? Because I think when you take Freeview and you take FreeSat, these are plat these are these are not products like iPad. They're platforms, yeah. And I think that area is without the without doubt someone we need to collaborate on. I think when it comes to merger of you, I think we've got to be a little bit careful in terms of the frontline products because the BBC iPlayer is the BBC, and we know that attribution and ITV Hub is strong as ITV Hub, and they need to speak for themselves. But actually part of those brands are going to be those brands and the attribution of the brand. The value of the BBC is not just in programming. It's programming and service. Yeah. Programming and service. So I think we've got to look at platform level. There's huge amounts of collaboration that we can do. I'm not sure in the short term it's about merging the products at this point. Yeah. So I've got two questions about younger audiences, which I'm sure you've thought a lot about. One is yep. from Jadisola Taiko, who asks, do you think that the license fee as a funding model would have been successful with the younger generation? More and more young people aren't paying the license fee and are instead going towards streaming services such as Netflix. How can the BBC maintain the interests of young people? And then the next one is from Peter Lunt, who says, what's the BBC's plan for young audiences now and as the BBC's future audience? BBC Three was cut despite huge protest, and now it's back. The youth have already left the Netflix and TikTok. Even if you have content, they're not checking the schedule. Um, so allow me one def defensive comment or two, and then I'll tell because I think this is a huge challenge for us. Huge challenge, of course, it's for all all you know organisations when that people have infinite choice. That's you know infinite choice. And by the way, the biggest competitor for most media companies may well be certainly in my household Fortnite, not netflix yeah i mean seriously it, it, i think this is a it's completely opened up in terms mm -hmm. of where we're at the defensive twitch is 80 percent is actually 83 percent that numbers i looked at just before i came in of 16 to 34s are coming to the bbc every week our numbers we're the biggest company for 16 to 34s across why because yeah, which channels where, where are they what, what they're channels coming, are they coming to? It's, a, it's a it's it's not one dominant thing but it is absolutely news radio mm -hmm. one does well not just linear but also the, the in bbc sounds some of the some of the on-demand product we've got there um but if you take this if you ask the, the question was on the second question what's the plan for young audience the first is going to be is a very simplistic answer, but it just happens to be where it's at, which is you have to get killer content for them and you have to keep the killer content on the BBC. So let me give you an example. Peaky Blinders on Sunday has a huge youth audience. And Peaky Blinders should be on the iPlayer all back seasons. You get the idea. Yeah. The Apprentice has a huge youth, or huge youth audience. Particularly, this season's done really well. So the first thing is you have to, and, and what I know about this audience is they find the shows. They find the shows. If if Peaky is a hot show, that we can get them to iPlayer. The question is, can we keep them in iPlayer? And have we got enough of that content? And the truth is, we need to really not just copy the commercial opposition, but have. You know, take Louis Theroux, huge youth audience, yeah, doing extremely well on iPlayer. We have to do more of that. We have to have killer content, killer talent. Um, the other thing, by the way, is we have to shape the offer so that news, we, we are, as a linear broadcaster, clearly we're focused on the 6 o'clock bulletin or the 10 o'clock. It is the live stream that they'll come to for us, for Ukraine. They're not going to sit down, many mm -hmm. of them, and watch a half an hour news bulletin we need to be mapped, and I think we've got a lot more work to do on our digital offer. And then what we share with platforms, we're talking to the platforms and what comes back to the BBC. So we've got a lot of work to do. Remember last point, by the way, 80% of GCSE students come to the BBC for revision, GCSE revision for bite size. So mm. it just, it's not, we're not trying to beat Netflix. I don't necessarily need every hour of people's media consumption. We yeah. know that if people spend a few hours and I know I've got a battle. I'm not being naive. I think we've all got a real job on our hands and we cannot assume a natural, a natural kind of um, 
scale a natural scale we've got to earn it without the benefit of distribution advantage and that is a huge change cultural change for the organization it's massive yeah no and it's clear i mean the the, the loyalty of young audience is just isn't that you know people like me who's like day can't start without the today program and radio four they're just it's a different you know uh, I think younger audiences are just in a different place. They have much more choice and they're much less loyal. And so you've got to keep them engaged. Absolutely right. I think the the other thing is they may have a different pattern of consumption. So, you know, as long as being, as long as they come to me, me, the BBC and, (laughs) and, and, and say, look, I need to check the news. What, and this is what we are seeing. And I'm not being naive about this. They're going to all kinds of sources. They're going to TikTok. They're going, and I good for them, but they come back often to the BBC to get the facts to say, okay, and, and I've got faith in that. Now I think we have to we have to really be innovative around format, talent, all the things you need to do, and not just assume that putting the six o'clock news on digital is gonna is gonna is gonna do it. You need to reshape the organization. You'll see us do more of that. We will reshape the organization to be more appealing in its format, as well as making sure we've got the right hits for young people, because we need that. So let me give you a question about um, about uh, national debate. A question from Vilda Shanky Sunderland. Uh, you talked about the importance of the BBC being a facilitator of national discussions and the importance of big niches. Can you pl- can you clarify what you mean by big niches and how can the BBC unify the nation and create national discussions when the nation's media use are becoming ever more fragmented? Um, she, really, really big questions, which I haven't got all the answers for. There you go. I, th- I think it's really, it's, a, it's, a, it's the big niches comment. Let me just deal with that one first. Was more about internationally, by the way, was that that was a particular comment with regard to, for instance, Britbox is particularly British drama of a certain style. And it works really well. Mm-hmm. And it's got north of 2 million and growing fast in terms of US households, which, by the way, is a lovely business. Mm. But it is a niche bit. It's an and it's a subscription business, and it works really well. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's what I mean by big niches. Big niche. Yeah, uh, and I think they're very. That we're not going to beat Disney in the in the US in terms of subscriber numbers. But mm. when you talk about news, you talk about British drama. Real opportunity. That's what I meant by big niches, and that was really about. Now, I think by the way, there's an analogy in the UK where Six Music, you know, especially big niche, really important. You've got the connection. Yeah. Our, 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 many of our services in the UK are very big niches that are differentiated versus the market. The, the point you make about um, how do you really make sure that debate, it's actually a question I'm asking <laughs> internally, we're talking about and we haven't, we haven't cracked it, which is you've got to think in this digital age, there must be ways in which we can engage more people in democratic debate. And my problem and my challenge is how do we not, how do we make sure that is, it's, it's such a good question this, because it's quite easy to do it among those that are really interested, <laughs> if yeah. I put it that way. Do you know what I mean? You're going to, I like yeah. the home fixture. I think it's a real challenge. And by the way, if anyone's listening and got a really good answer, I'll probably get lots of emails. There, but if it is, we are interested in testing ideas where could we get more, it links to that public opinion point. And how could you do this at a broader level? Now we certainly, we certainly do it really well with yeah the traditional architecture of question time and any quick they're really really good programs there are mm. millions of people's their scale there's millions of people coming in but how do you do that digitally and it not become an echo chamber for 30 angry people bluntly is a real <laughs> challenge and i think we've got to be careful of that because the problem with digital of course we all know it is you know we'll write up you know everyone in twitter is angry and actually you're looking at or you know other social media platforms are available but you may end up with reacting to five people 50 people whatever and and i think it's a really good challenge and we've cracked it in broadcast but i think it's a real area where i'd like to spend more time in digital yeah yeah it's a big challenge to not be basically hosting fringe conversations and giving them prominence that they don't necessarily deserve i've got two final questions about kind of the politics around uh, this, uh, which we'll close on. One is from Alan Jack, who says, does the BBC have metrics on whether people view it as an as independent from government? 
And then a question from Lee Edwards, professor, of, professor at the LSE on strategic communications and public engagement in our media and communications department. And Lee asks, Ofcom's 2020, 2021 research, small screen, big debate, was a significant attempt to develop a national conversation around the future of the BBC. In relation to the democratic ambitions you have for the BBC, how has that research informed your own views about the future and how will you continue those conversations with the public going forward? Um, so let's do, do we, we do, we research trust in the BBC. We research um, basically traditional access, left, right, I mean, I mean, I'll just give you, I mean, actually, I'll go to a third party source because the BBC giving its own data. I mean, uh, recent data, I think, was showing us um, pretty balanced, you know, um, in terms of uh, most people think we're doing a reasonable job or don't know. And then 20 ish percent on either side to left to to right. Um, it, it's fairly balanced. It's I mean, everyone will be screaming at the screen now because they probably have their own view. But it, the, the data is fairly balanced i i think my our biggest challenge is group think around and i've said this publicly many times which is i think too much of it is worrying about left and right which you can you can work. a lot of it is society now is defined by more societal issues around you know environmentalism or campaign issues we all know this it's often mm -hmm. making sure you're in the right place on all of those things so that's also research that we need to do and see um, as we as we go through it Look, I think there's been actually beyond the Ofcom research, uh, there's been a number of bits of, um, uh, you know, research, in, and, and we'll go back up to the top. I think what it does is say, um, and I kind of repeat, it, it basically reaffirms my view that we're gonna we're gonna win, if I may, or, and preserve what we what we care about, or certainly I care about, by doubling down on our distinctiveness and our points of difference, not chasing the market. We absolutely have to have faith that while, you know, and this is why, we, you know, commercial model is different. I'm not, this is not, I mean, we've got, I've run commercial business. They're just different. You are trying to drive revenue and monetize, you know, clicks and all of that. We, we, we're not wholly going for reach. This is really important. We're not just trying to go as broad as possible. We need to do that, be pretty broad to justify mm. universality. But under my leadership we, we and, and with my team, we are absolutely obsessed with doing that in the right way, not just pushing for reach for it. So, and that, I actually think when you look at the Ofcom research, now, the change in the market, it really locks you into it. You have to be differentiated. You have to be public service. We are, we are an organization with a pur purpose. And I think our really interesting challenge is, can we build the only digital public service media organization in the world of scale? and that is that is what we're about yeah and that, that's a really big challenge and i think the ofcom research all, also it, it just emphasized the risks we've got which is if we define ourselves solely on linear broadcasting that will not be enough simple as that i like the idea of distinctive reach you know reach but with that something that's very very distinctive and i think you've um you've described uh, uh, the challenge of, of, I mean, let's face it, the, the BBC will set the, will, will provide the paradigm for digital public service broadcasting, whatever that is, you're the, let's be frank, you're the biggest, you're the best. Um, and, 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 and your ability to define what that means in the future uh, will, will determine the model for the rest of the world. You've been around for 100 years. Happy birthday. You. Um, if you've been around for that long, you've figured some things out. And of course, as we know from history, institutions that survive 100 years have done that because they've known how to adapt to a very changed world. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing your thoughts about the future of the BBC. Uh, and I have no doubt that over the years ahead, you will be defining the future of public service broadcasting, not just for the UK, but for the whole world. So thank you again so much thanks for so joining much. us. And thanks to the audience for fantastic questions uh, and for continuing to engage in the debate on this incredibly important issue for all of us. Thank you, Tim. Thank you.